Trinidad, East Staff, Jules from the UK, Renee from London. Okay, super excited that you guys are all here. Um, awesome. California. Amazing. Are you raising your hand? Paolona. York, New Valley. Okay, amazing. Integrating trauma. Perfect. Take away information on attachment or working on that in therapy. Okay, guys, this is what we're going to do because I want to make sure that you get the most out of this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. Um, what we'll do for the sake of today, since the video is not working, is if you can... Hi, Chaim. What I would like to do is if you can mute yourself and if you have any question, just unmute yourself. Like I'm happy to be informal and really just to hear any questions that you might have. Um, so for now, unless you have a specific question before we begin, just go ahead and unmute yourself. We are going to be recording this. So if any of you want to um, rewatch it after, then you shall be able to. Okay. So we are going to dive in. Give it a second. Okay. The four essential sessions. I'm just going to tell you the reason that I created this um, training, this webinar. I think some of you know me more than others, but my name is Esther Goldstein and I am a therapist. And I feel like I had this feeling of like being lost or not really being sure, like how can I actually get the most out of being a therapist? How can I get the most out of my being in the field, helping clients feeling clear. And one of the primary things that I found I was unclear about is, yeah, of course we learn, like you have to meet your client where they're at, but in my advanced training and in getting advanced consultation, what I realized is one of the most important things that one of my consultants taught me is really being clear on what kind of session, essentially it's also what kind of treatment plan do you have? So it's what kind of treatment plan do you and your client have? Um, and then what kind of session are you gonna have that day, that month, that, that, chapter that you're in. And I think it, it, I think it helps because then it helps integrate um, almost the agreement. It also helps with setting realistic expectations. If somebody comes in and they have complex childhood trauma and they expect you to heal their anxiety that they've had for 20 years, like you're, you're not going to, you want to set expectations that your clients can hit. Dr. Scott Miller talks a lot about this in terms of his outcomes conversations, but let me just dive in and give you the four essential sessions that I think are really important um, because I want you to be able to walk away with something really tangible and useful. Okay, so who I am, just for those of you who might not yet know who I am, my name is Esther Goldstein. I'm a mom. I live in New York in Long Island and I own and run a therapy group practice and I also have um, a trauma therapist training and consultation program that runs twice a year in January and in June. And um, it's a six month training program where you get certificate of completion at the end. And what I've seen is I've really, I love teaching and training therapists to provide a sense of community and also really good clinical input. Um, so like I was saying, my story was, I used to feel pretty confused, like going into clinical sessions or even in embodying what it means to be a therapist. Am I being helpful to clients? Um, am I being clear? Can I go to sleep with a feeling of professional integrity or I'm living a meaningful life that supports me, my clients, and also really supports my personal life? And we'll talk about that as well. Because um, I know there's a lot of like information out there where there's therapists or a business owner saying like, here's how you could build a profitable, profitable practice or a group practice or whatever you're looking for. But sometimes they're really skipping over the clinical piece which I think we can't skip over, right? A highly ethical practice is so important. Good clinical skills is really important. Also, it's important to know how to run a business, right? If you're in a group practice or if you have a role or if you're working in a workplace, like what are the boundaries? What are, what's the infrastructure? Is it clear for your clients? We'll talk about that soon. So I am pretty confident in my ability to help therapists, especially because, well, there's one piece and I think I've gotten better over time at, naming what hasn't been named. Um, I think I shared this many times, but I've written and I keep writing blogs from my heart. Either there's a concept I see um, in the clients I'm treating or a concept I was curious about. I talk pretty openly about my experience becoming a somatic therapist. I'm a sensory motor psychotherapist. I've done all three years, gotten a lot of consultation and then some other training. It's really helped me with my own body anxiety 
that used to bother me. So I remember at times years ago going online looking for a blog or looking for information that was easy to understand and digestible and it really wasn't. So I was like, hey, I'm, I have access to these experts I'm getting consult from. I'm doing my training. I'm helping clients. Let me create information that just helps people feel less alone and more understood. Um, so my website gets about 80,000 hits a month. And to me, that's just like, it's it's really heartwarming when I get messages from people around the world thanking me for writing. There's something on like body flashbacks or what does it mean to develop a more secure relational attachment or, right? Like, I think just normalizing and also giving concepts that are then easy to digest and implement, which is what I also then did as being a therapist who supports therapists, right? So what I like to do is to create content that speaks to the heart. I built a group practice. I have a book actually um, that I've written with the new Harbinger. I just saw one of my friends went online on Amazon. Um, if you put in my name, Esther Goldstein, it's a book called um, EMDR for Anxiety with the new Harbinger. So they're already, they're allowing people to buy it for a pre-published date. Um, I wanted to call it EMDR for rebels just because I think good therapy needs like you, I don't, I think it's important to learn any kind of therapy method, EMDR, somatic, IFS, but I think it's important to also know clinical nuance of where do you use the structure of the skills and where do you kind of um, adjust it to your clinical nuance and to the complexities. Um, I offer trauma consultation and I've been an invited speaker to corporate wellness programs and other um, locations to talk about health and wellness. Um, and a lot of the people I work with in my trauma training or in consultation, I'm often looking at how can I teach you the skills, how can you become really good at what you do and also open up other possibilities for you. Some people want to be full-time in private practice or some people want to be just more clinically nuanced and confident in whatever clinic they're working at. Some people have other hopes and dreams in terms of writing a book or being an invited speaker. So I've kind of done that. I do that. And I'm always looking at how can we help you be seen and celebrated as a person, just like you want to do that for your clients, right? Some clients want less panic, more capacity to connect. Some people have that and they want more. They want to leave a different kind of legacy or they want to move. They want to go through a big change. Both of those are possible. So I've helped therapists, leaders, and clients. And my mission really is to create trauma healing because I think we all know that trauma creates disconnection between our own minds, hearts, and bodies. And healing creates connection between ourselves, others, and the world. Um, here are some pictures from some of my staff from my group practice. Took my staff on a retreat. Um, one of the big things that I find really important is for therapists to feel supported and connected to each other. Almost all of my clinicians, so I started a group practice and there's different opinions in terms of group practice business models. My clinicians, the ones, what I've done, and I still do this right now because I have staff at my office is I'll take clinicians on, help them grow. I like helping them really gain a lot of good clinical skills, have a sense of community, after a few years, they go out on their own, whatever that might mean, their own private practice. And what I realized is one of them actually told me when she left on her exit interview, she's like, this was like a quantum leap in my career. She's like, I didn't know because I, I hired her from a clinic and I saw she had great skills and I was like, I want to teach you. And so I teach not just clinical skills, but also skills to how do you create a really robust and profitable practice, but always focusing on the clinical piece as primary. So there's a lot that my clinicians learned and I'm so proud of them. I have clinicians right now as well, and I think that's a similar trajectory. Um, and then here are just some of the podcasts, some of the places I've been. Actually, Trauma Therapist Podcast asked me to be a host to interview some people. So if anyone has an area of expertise, or they might want me to interview them down the line, or if you're working on expertise, then I guess keep it in mind for down the road. Okay, building an ethical and profitable trauma therapy practice. For anyone, I see that some people raise their hand. I'm not going to be looking at hand raises just because I I'm not good at multitasking. So if you have a question or a comment, just unmute yourself. Um, but I, I guess I would love if you can we till we get through some slides because as we dive into the meaty aspects of the slides um, and you have questions, I want to answer those. Okay, but I'm saying like I'm not ignoring the the chat. I just can't look at the chat box. I know Nicole's checking the chat box. She's our incredible admin. Um, but I'm just going to be going through the slide. Okay. Building an ethical and profitable trauma therapy practice. I think when it comes to being trauma informed or trauma therapist, it's a little different when you are building a practice or in the professional arena, clients have a higher standard for you. You need to have a level of nuance and clarity and also a level of transparency for yourself and for your clients. I think it's different, right? I think we know trauma informed therapy means that you're not doing harm. The, the bar is not so high. Um, but if you really want to provide trauma therapy and provide deeper relief, it's really your responsibility to 
um, do work on your own self-development, get more training. And so I have to say, like every one of you, I really respect and admire all of you for being here um, because I think it takes like humility. I know there were times that I felt anxious and lost and confused and a little scrambled. I think many people know I used to drive into the Bronx to see Dr. Brad Foote because he specialized in dissociation. I would speak to Lynette Danilchuk, a psychologist in um, California. I spoke to Kathy Steele, who wrote a book on dissociation. I've spoken to, I don't have to mention all the names, but I just felt like I had a responsibility to make sure that I'm getting in touch with the experts if I was seeing clients who had complex trauma. I needed to know that I was doing right by them and getting good consultation. So I think those who are checked in and have questions are the ones who actually have um, a higher sense of humility and a higher sense of professional integrity. So hats off to you. So in terms of building right a, a trauma therapy practice, I think one of the things we want to look at is how are you structuring if you're in a workplace or if you have um, individual clients, we need a really clear structure, safety, boundaries, and boundaries are not just physical boundaries. It's even the way that you do or don't communicate with clients. You also want to be clear about your clinical outcomes. What does it mean to set clinical outcomes? There's so many assessment measures and you'll see, I'll go through this soon, but there was a practice that once told me that they track their clients' progress. And we do too. We check in and we have questions in terms of how a client's doing. We do these check-ins. Um, but I think when it comes to trauma and complex trauma, it's a little trickier because you might be seeing someone for six months and maybe they don't have a certain level of symptom reduction, but they're starting to integrate you and develop a trusting relationship with you in a way they never did with another therapist. So I think being clear on what are your goals, right? Scott Miller is the one who talks about getting really clear on what does it mean to have clinical outcomes? How do you track success? How do you define success? What is success? And you talk to clients about it. How you're open to feedback, not that you're like begging them for validation, but there's a certain level of transparency um, and then setting really clear treatment goals that help you reach success. I think it's really important to improve your work-life harmony. Sometimes those of us in the field work really hard on helping our clients when we lose or neglect ourselves along the way, especially because most therapists, if not all, um, we're in some ways caretakers, caretaker for yourself, caretaker to other people in your life. Um, and so really learning how to find that harmony, I think is important, right? If you're taking good care of your clients, but you're neglecting your home life, I, I don't know that that's considered success, right? Um, and if you're great at your home life, but you're really not clear with your clients or you're not really checked into good clinical skills, that's also. Um, what I want you to do is get better referrals and have satisfied clients. People ask me questions all the time. How did you build a practice? And they start asking me questions. And Although I think it's really important to think like, how do I get more clients? How do I get more clients if you're in a place of building? How do I get more speaking engagements? How can people actually trust me more? I always look at like, well, what are you, what are you communicating? What are you saying or not saying, right? People can feel energetically, just like our clients might come into our relationship with a graspy energy, a moody energy, be angry, be shut down, and people around them respond without them saying anything. Same thing with us and the universe. In my community, I wasn't saying, guys, I love trauma. It was like I was sticking my nose into books. I wanted to learn. I'm passionate about it. I love helping to make sense for myself and for clients and for other people. How can we feel understood in a world where we feel so alone? And when you do that, naturally, you're going to get people who are getting that sense from you. You're going to get more re referrals and you'll have more satisfied clients. Now, here's the thing that therapists, what I see across the board, right? What therapists are doing right and what therapists are doing wrong, or they might not be getting right, okay? Now, I think what most therapists are doing right is that, just want to make sure that you can all see the screen. I think what most therapists are doing right is that they are, those of you on here, um, are checked into being aware of the newer therapeutic skills, right? The therapists in my trauma cohort, in this training program, they are all trained. They have really good clinical knowledge and training, a lot of skills, have incredible therapeutic relationships with our clients. I have to say, like, you're, you're already a great therapist. That's not a question. The question is, is like, where are therapists sometimes getting things wrong? And I think the place where therapists are sometimes getting thing, things wrong is, one, a lack of proper support. So you might be in a consultation group or in a training program, but it's not seeing you for who you are. Um, and then it's not seeing your clients for who they are. I remember um, doing a training in DBT and I love DBT as a skill, but I remember asking questions about a client, one who was highly suicidal, another one who used to be highly suicidal. We helped her become more functional. Now she had existential questions and feelings of aloneness. My DBT consultant couldn't answer me. 
um, about the questions I had. And so I needed a whole lot more. I needed something very different. So I just want to share this because this is an important piece for us to look at is like, are you surrounded by the right kind of support and skills that you need? That's one piece. The other thing is, are you clear about your expectations for clients and with clients, right? Sometimes we make these, um, we make either these big promises or we make like two small promises. We're going too quickly or too slowly and we're not clear on what's going on. And I want you to be very clear so that it's not just a client is coming to you because you're trained in EMDR. Big whoop. I got trained in EMDR and I didn't know how to actually help clients get relief for a good couple of years until I got advanced training. In our last cohort, we had somebody getting trained in EMDR and she said she offered EMDR um, and her client had like a very strong ab reaction. And I said, wait, hold on. Let's just go through the consultation. Let's talk about application so you could really use this in a way that's helpful for your client. Right. So the nuances, the actual practical implementation, I think that's where the magic really happens of you want to own the knowledge and the skills you need to and then be able to apply it to your client as well. You need to feel seen to get that personalized support and then to help your client. Okay, so here is what I want to say, right? What do therapists do? What do the therapists who are rock stars do well? Okay, here's some just some images of the people who have taken our training or have signed their who practices or their clinicians up for my trauma training and consultation program. What I found across the board with all of these people or with therapists who are doing wonderful work is that they have great training. That's already the thing that they're doing right, right? Eleanor right here, she's incredible. She's trained as a brain spotting therapist. She's trained in EMDR. She has a lot of advanced training. She's actually written a book, possibly even two. We were just working on her shame download. Um, she specializes in shame and we were talking about tweaking some of her messaging in her shame download to be a little bit more relatable to the pain point of the client so more people would click in and get relief and then obviously for the right clients to work with her. Um, but she also had this goal of just like, let's normalize shame. Let's talk about where shame is, right? She's incredible. Here's Tamara Allison. Here is Melanie. Melanie Spurgeon works in, um, she is a somatic experiencing psychotherapist, EMDR trained, brilliant, amazing. She joined our cohort because she wanted that practical implementation to really be able to apply, to personalize and to get a, a sense of community. And I think what's amazing about, I don't create this. I think it's more of like a synergy of the group is that the clinicians are coming in with so much knowledge, but then there's a different viewpoint that people get from each other. I mean, I keep the cohort really small so you get that personalized attention from each other and also from me, um, but that's just, you know, specific. Radalisa, actually in our cohort, she ended up leaving one of her clinic jobs and started her own private practice because she gained a lot more clinical confidence and was clearer on her um, clients that she's good at treating. Here's Tabby. Tabitha runs a group practice. She signed herself and her clinicians up for my trauma training. They're all very smart and have advanced trainings. They wanted help with um, personalizing the knowledge and implementing it. And there's a lot of downloads and assessments and videos and exercises that they wanted. Um, and then Amy Peters is incredible. She uh, is located in Germany and was working with soldiers coming back from war in Afghanistan and was doing um, intervention for clients with pretty intense symptoms. But back to this, what therapists who are amazing have, they have great training. What therapists need, I could speak for myself, like what, what did I need and what do I need? Always has been having people in my corner. Just like your client needs you in their corner, you're taking the time to get to know them. I always talk about this parallel process, right? Um, your client is coming because they wanna feel understood by you, that you're invested in them. If you're not invested in them, they're gonna feel it, okay? Um, and being able to really support them, their life, and where they're going. Same thing here. Therapists need that, that personal implementation and support. And then what do you get? Community, sustainability, sustainability, aka <laughs> managing burnout. Um, and I'm laughing only because I think many of us have experienced burnt out, burnout. I've experienced levels of burnout where I was like, if I don't find a different way of navigating um, this this part of myself or my schedule, like I'm not gonna stay in this field and I love this field and I think that I can contribute a lot. And so I've looked at what allows sustainability in terms of being a mom, being a community leader, taking care of my health and also showing up in a way that's aligned with who I am. And then profitability, I think at the end of the day, like there's a shame around making money around being a therapist, but if you're not taking care of yourself and you're not getting your basic needs met or if you're not having savings for, um, some of your like what retirement, then how are you taking care of yourself? 
How are you then going to go talk to clients about setting boundaries and getting into relationships or taking better care of their vision and their dreams? So I just, I want, that's one of my protective pieces is like, you have training. Now let's even help you digest it and embody it in a deeper level. The other thing that therapists who are really fulfilled and clients feel this is they feel fulfilled because they're setting realistic and growth expectations. You're not staying status quo. We know this. You're either going up or you're going down. And up doesn't mean that you need to be hitting every single goal or be outrunning people in your life, but it's that you're in a place of continuous growth, growth as a person, growth as a professional, be it in your spiritual life. And the thing about profit, I will have to say is I don't think profit is money always. Profit is not always money. I share this pretty openly. For my group practice, there was a certain year where I had so many staff. I think we were at like eight clinicians um, and we, our client caseload was pretty full. People were doing really well. And there was a day that I woke up and I was like, I wasn't as present for my child. And in my head, it was just like my own, one of my consultants was like, let's build the practice. Let's open up more locations. Some of the clinicians were like, hey, let's franchise. We'll have other locations. And I was like, no, that's not aligned with me. I want a practice and a life and making an impact in a way that also takes good care of my life. And it didn't feel right to have to manage this much energy, this many people. And I didn't want to just hire somebody under me because I didn't want to have like a watered down, like a chicken coop practice where you're just seen by anyone, right? And we're just trying to see clients. Like, no, to me, it's like you need a high level of training, oversight, and provide a certain level of care. So profit to me is, and I could talk about this for your practice or wherever you're working, is that obviously that you are making money, but that you have a quality of life, that you have space to actually live your dreams. I remember one of our clinicians um, got engaged and was getting married and she was talking about how can she communicate with her clients about this change? She came in wearing a ring. And I said to her, isn't it interesting? Like we don't want our clients to know when we're suffering, but suffering has almost been like normalized. But when there's, there's a celebration, I want them to see that too, right? I said to her, I looked her in the eye and I was like, tell me, think about what it was to get here to find a beautiful love for your life and to get married. And what are these dreams and how beautiful, you don't have to talk about it too much, but to embody and personalize and personify health and wellness and getting your needs met. Obviously in a way that you're also wanting to do that for your clients, okay? It means, so I think profit means feeling fulfilled, confident and getting a return on investment for schooling, for your time that feels aligned with who you are and your mission in this world. Some of us, our mission is to have a caseload of five and to make an impact or to educate schools about trauma-informed knowledge or to talk to our own families about it. Some of us want to write a book. Some of us want to grow into a group. Everyone has different mission in this world, but really being aligned with your why. Okay, and now we're going to dive into clinical clarity and I'm going to go into the four different kinds of therapy sessions. But before we do that, I'm going to sing that I want to take a breath. So um, what I'm going to invite you all to do is breathe with me if you're comfortable. So feel your feet on the ground. I'm just going to do that with moving my feet up and down. I'm just going to feel into my body, shake my hands, throw them out. I just remember we had right. this here. Oh. Hi, Alexi. Do you have a question before we dive in? Let's dive in. Clinical clarity. So I put up a picture of this ship because just like if you are the captain of a ship and you're going in and you know that there will be times like right here. Okay, this is a sailboat, but right here, the theme is there are going to be calm waters and it's going to be time that you're sailing and you're getting from one destiny, from one place to someplace else. Yes, it will be smooth sometimes. And just like here, see the water, the waves are choppy and there's storms coming ahead, you see those clouds, you plan for both. And even if it's not very stormy, or even if it's not very calm, you plan for both of these. For any of you, who've, for any of you who've downloaded my tree, my free trauma therapist toolkit, I have like a, like a, a few page um, handout and there's a specific page that lots of therapists have used with our clients. I'm so grateful um, that they do and they give me feedback. Um, that is basically the pacing and pressing on the brakes on the gas pedal. You should download it if you don't yet have it. It's free. Um, but basically where we talk about how do we have clarity and we set our clients up for success and we have a roadmap, right? And expecting road jumps along the way. Okay, let's dive in. 
the four primary trauma therapy sessions that are important for us to be aware of are boundaries, attachment, shock trauma, and developmental trauma. Okay, these are the primary kinds to keep in mind. Um, I find really funny uh, right here. I just, I think humor is really important. Um, so right here, there's a therapist holding up a sign for her client. And it says, I said, how do you feel? And there is emotions, but it says like passive aggressive scale, right? She's almost like being passive aggressive. Like, how do you feel? She's not checking in on him. And then here is really fun. Funny here is like a therapist looking out the window and she said, I said, I think, I said, I think you might have some avoidance issues, right? He like jumped out the window or whoever her client was. Um, I think sometimes like, well, not sometimes, always, I think humor is so important when it comes to working with our clients. Okay. So here's what I'm going to talk to you about. The next few minutes, we're going to go into the four kinds of clients I've worked with. Always, as always, client information has been changed to protect client confidentiality. I'm literally just showing you information for the sake of education purposes. So please hold that in mind. But we're going to be talking about clients that I've worked with in one way or another. When you work on a boundary session, attachment sh session, shock trauma session, and developmental trauma session. Okay, boundary session. So here's my client, Sean. Okay, the boundaries work that I got a sense that he needed to work on were emotional boundaries, sexual boundaries. He was struggling relationally with codependence. And it's interesting because codependence, people think just means people who are enmeshed, right? The generic people think um, either there's someone who has like a narcissistic tendency or is more of a taker. And then there's the person who's more of like the giver and the caretaker who's more of, um, right, the person who's, who's needing and depending on the other person, but really just to give. I think codependence sometimes presents in a different kind of way than we might imagine. Sometimes um, a couple or a relationship or friendships can look balanced, but beneath the surface in the back end, right? If you look at the, the wiring, there's almost like some kind of dynamic that's being played out. And so essentially he was a very, um, although he seemed like a very muscular, tall, powerful man, okay? He worked in construction. Um, there was also an element of him that was so afraid of disappointing people that he would just say what he thought they wanted to hear. And he was in a relationship and he basically, um, he came in talking about how frustrated he was in the relationship. He was with someone for a while. She had complaints about feeling like he was far away. And as I was sitting with him talking, all I heard was a man who doesn't know if he can say what he wants. He wasn't even sure what he wanted. And so he kind of just went off of what he thought the other person wanted and gave them that. And so essentially the, it's like needing, you're almost like only a mirror, right? It's like this, this inner fragility and not knowing who he, who he is. Okay, so he had a high level of depression and anxiety. With emotional and sexual um, boundaries, he wasn't sexually violating anyone, but he more energetically would sometimes come across in like a hypersexual kind of way, his energy. What happened was is that he didn't get a lot of attention. We'll talk about his child state parts here. And this part of him that kind of felt like, I won't have what I need if I don't make you happy, if I don't be the person you need me to be or who I think you need me to be, right? Like him and this girlfriend. Um, but he only learned how to get attention as he got older and he was very good looking and charming. And so he almost like later on in life, um, almost like latched onto that and became very charming, a little over sexual sometimes in his demeanor or even in energy. Um, and so in our therapy work right off the bat, you know, he wanted to talk about his relationship, but as we started speaking about what his hopes and goals were, what I was hearing is a real lack of identity of self and the lack of clear boundaries. Okay. And in real time, just so you know, one of the things I'm always looking for is what's the core belief, right? This little kiddo, he didn't have parents who had clear boundaries, right? Mom was a caretaker, but not just a caretaker. She was chronically, um, emotionally reactive to people around her. And it's really hard. I'll just say like being a human, being a mom, being just a human being on this planet, and then being a therapist, a group practice owner, just being a human, I think that when we're tapped into connections, like we notice things and we are impacted and learning a healthy level of detachment or connection, but not having like a hypersensitive emotional reaction or taking it in is really a skill that is hard to learn, but we kind of need to learn that if we want to be healthy, functional, balanced people and be able to be in relationships with all the layers that go on, right? In relationships so you can 
be connected and also have a healthy level of disconnect. Mom was like that and dad was very checked out. So he kind of had to find this balance between, you know, holding his own emotions. He didn't want to burden mom with his emotions, but also was trying to identify what does it mean to be masculine? What does it mean to be a man? Right. So we didn't really have a template or he did, but there were a lot of missing pieces Dad kind of came in, provided, but then would be checked out. And so a lot of he as a little boy, as we did some inner child work and parts work, there was this core belief from when he was younger and it kind of got stronger as he was older was I won't have what I need if I don't like what I just said. I'm not hypersensitive to what you need. If I don't have to mind read, right? If I don't mind read what you need and give you what you need, I'm not, you're going to leave me or I'm going to be alone or, or I don't know, right? He was so afraid of mom not being okay. So our work was really developing the capacity to have some kind of just presence of who he was. Now we didn't start there. We started with therapeutically. We developed a relationship. I was pretty clear about what therapy is and isn't. He was very um, friendly, almost too friendly. It's like he, he needed me to like him in order for us to do good work together. And I said, look, I'm working with you because I think I can help you. Um, but you don't have to like cozy up to me. Actually, like if there is that dynamic, that's something we're going to look at. Because what I want to help you be able to work on is feeling um, like you can develop a relationship that feels secure enough over time where you can bring different parts of you in without you needing to work so hard to keep the relationship going, right? And then it's also not authentic. So this was like really powerful work. We worked with like the sadness and the fear that was really beneath the part of him that had to be codependent. Um, and these emotional and sexual, like where he was like overly giving and then obviously sometimes shut down because it was too much. We worked on what does it mean to have like generic connection without having to try so hard. So in session, we use like somatic exercises. Um, we did, I mean, a lot of this, we have a whole module in my trauma cohort on boundaries, but I think I actually told him over time, he said, I want to talk about my relationship, this, that, the other. And I said, I want to talk to you about boundaries because I think it's really important. Now, what you'll also find, I will say, is there are some clients who've either been neglected or abused or traumatized and boundaries, obviously boundaries, it's like without needing to say like clarity on how you work. Um, being clear about your services agreement, which I have in my practice. Anyone who joins my cohort, you get a copy of like services agreement, you personalize it, what you do or don't do. So you have a very clear infrastructure of your relationship. So then your client, especially one who hasn't had clear practical, emotional time boundaries really knows where they land. And then they could borrow that template or that clarity capacity and bring it to other relationships, right? And no one wants to say this is too much or I can keep doing this. Um, attachment sessions. Anyone have questions on, you know what? I'm actually going to ask um, for questions after I do attachment and the two different trauma types. Okay. Attachment session. Jacqueline was a client who came in because she would talk about feeling chronically alone. She felt chronically alone even when she was surrounded by people, but she was also getting into relationships at work um, and in her personal life with people who... It was hard to know in the beginning if it was that they were emotionally unavailable or if it's that her grasp, the energy pushed them away. So I had a hard time in the beginning when she came in and she first like started talking about other people. I was trying to discern, is it that she's just drawn to the wrong kind of people who are like underdeveloped or, you know, not necessarily wholesome people? Or is it that she's like um, engaging from a very like needy, graspy place? And I don't believe in needy. I think needy usually means there's an unmet need. Um, but obviously in therapy, we want to work on having that need met so the client can interact with adult relationships from a place of more wholeness, because it's not our adult relationships job to fill our child's emotional needs. Right. Um, but over time, I realized it was a combination of both. And then I'll talk about her presentation. It was a combination of both. Right. So with clients, sometimes it's like, oh, they're so needy. Of course, they're turning everyone off or, oh, well, the people in their life are unhealthy. It was both. There were some people in her life that she was drawn to right? I wrote it here. We needed to stop the unconscious enactment in real life. There were times that she unconsciously would pursue a relationship where a person really didn't have capacity, emotional capacity, intellectual capacity. And me from an outsider was so confused because it was like, why are you chasing this person? Like they're not worth your time or they're a very different emotional caliber or social caliber. Um, like they don't even have anything to offer you. And those enactments were connected to a very young part of her that would, gra would grasp for attention from her mom. Um, she had an abandonment wounding, we'll talk about it. It wasn't external, um, it wasn't an explicit abandonment wounding of someone leaving. It was implicit where she, her mom was there, but would leave, 
right? So many times we think about abandonment as I've written blogs on this, but you think about abandonment as like someone leaving. Um, you could have abandonment wounds with someone being there, but they emotionally remove themselves. And you're just like, it's, it's like a mind belief, right? It's like, you're here, you're not here, I, but I feel so insecure. Or I don't feel this feeling of security, but you are here. So I'm so confused, right? It's even worse if they gaslight you or if they're underdeveloped and they're like, but I'm here. Why do you not feel good? And it's like, oh, I have to give words to it, right? That's our job to help our clients give words to their experience. So some of them were like interesting that she was that she was engaging in enactment. And some of them was that there were relationships that had more capacity for health, but we needed to help her be able to, I needed to help her be able to um, hold her child self, right? Better, or this part of her that was grasping in relationships better to work through this grasp the need which actually in our consultation and my trauma training, I teach you a lot from Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen has these like five developmental um, motor action movements. She talks about like clients sometimes are stuck in a certain movement. She was stuck in a grasp, like in a pull. And so um, in our therapy session, somatically, I was working with her on the part that needed to pull. That's my job. Because if we're doing that work in therapy, if you're doing that work with your clients, the grasp and the need to grasp is going to lessen in their real in their lives, right? Because if I'm an adult, but I have a child part that's grasping because I'm alone, I don't want to stay stuck in the grasp. Really, it's be with me, or can you see me, or can you need my, notice my experience? I'm sad. I'm starting to think that maybe I'll be left, or maybe I just feel all alone. She felt alone somatically almost all the time, right? So if you're working with these core emotions and you're working with that pain and that grief and the sadness, what you're going to see is you're holding that, you're processing that. So if you're processing that, their adult self could interact with the world from a much more adult self way and be able to be realizing, okay, so I have these woundings. I'm working on them in therapy. I could notice the pain. Obviously, I'm talking about over a long time. It could be three months, six months, a year, two years, depends on the complexity of the client presentation and their current supports in their life and relationships. But or And over time, even they could develop a relationship if they don't have too much phobic avoidance. If they do, they still can. Um but essentially, they all have more capacity. It's always fascinating, right? So Jacqueline came in and she was like wanting to talk about all these relationships. What I realized is that we need to do some attachment oriented work with her um, because she was stuck. Like what I wanted to first work on just to lessen her pain and her distress was these chronic enactments. She was almost like operating um, in relation to these other relationships. And it was exhausting. And also it was just like reinforcing this belief of I'm all alone because she was more alone. Right, either by continuing to engage in relationships that were no good for her, which I wanted us to stop so she could actually value herself more. Obviously, I didn't see that to her, but that's, that was our goal. And also to be able to nourish relationships that she was able to hand select better, be a little pickier from this more adult self. So she felt more connected. And those feelings of aloneness started lessening because she's like, wow, I do have these invites. I do have these people. All right, sometimes our clients are bleeding out and it's like, I have to stop this bleeding out and then we can focus on building this. And you're also helping to build a healthier belief system because they're somatically able to start having different experiences in life, okay? Um, so this was her, right? In a, a relationship, she would be the grabbing one, really holding on for dear life. And she had this feeling of aloneness and there was this fear of if I get close, really the core fear, right? There's primary and secondary emotions. The primary, she was very afraid of... Um, being left alone, right? Or having a need. So it was like she was fluctuating between her basic emotional needs. Shock trauma, a client named Stephanie. Stephanie came in with flashbacks. So shock trauma is kind of like usually a single incident trauma, rape, car accident, um, being in a war, um, being fired, something specific, right? That's related to like a single incident trauma. Um, and so this client came in and she was presenting with shock trauma. So flashbacks of a specific event that she had. She was in a car accident. Every time she would get in the car, certain times of day, she would just have these images. She would have sensory flashbacks. You know, she would get very jumpy. She felt like she was living in trauma time, right? She went through this experience years before, about eight years before. A recent trigger brought up all of the flashbacks. She had dissociated from her memory, was functioning pretty well, actually was pretty high functioning in um, a law firm and was doing really well. But what was happening that she reached out is that she'd be very irritable. Sometimes she would like panic and other times she would just have these rage fits and just like um, like uh, lash out at some of her colleagues and they were just confused because she was a very sweet, they had patience with her because they knew that she, they knew who she was before this version of her, 
Um, but she was freaking out. She was like, I feel like I'm living in the time of a thing that happened, right? So what I needed to help her do um, was help her with a few of the skills. Some of it is like time orientation. Kathleen Martin talks about this. Um, and also working through the somatic belief that her body was feeling like it's happening now. Whoops, hold on. She felt like it was happening now. We needed to help create that dual awareness and then be able to work through those core emotions. And like what I wrote here, we needed to orient to the grief, the rage, right? There was grief around losses and what shifted for her um, rage and move through. This is huge. This is all about somatic work for shock trauma. Peter Levine talked about this, but any kind of good therapist knows this on a somatic level. We go through this in my training. Um, we have to help our clients move through whatever was interrupted. If it was a fight or flight, or any interrupted, right, interrupted survival strategy to reduce the intense emotional flooding. What happens with trauma, okay, we'll talk about shock trauma, it's similar with developmental trauma, a little different. Trauma is, um, I'm not going into the definition of trauma and all that, I assume you all know it. If you don't, happens to be, if you join my trauma training, there's such a thorough, robust segment on different kinds of trauma, the, the terms to use to educate your clients on it. Some clients don't wanna talk about the word trauma, don't, but you're working with our symptoms and the nervous system, but briefly, any kind of experience that's traumatic is there is, um, and there's videos on this, right? It's almost like something's happening and you usually feel alone. You feel disconnected from yourself. There's nothing you could have done to stop it from happening. You're not connected to anyone, right? And you didn't know what was coming. Now, the thing that happens to the body is um, usually there's an interrupted fight or flight. So fight is either if it's per interpersonal trauma, usually you'll see more of a developmental trauma. But even if it's interpersonal, let's say a rape. So fight is kind of like either I'm able to like push someone away, right? Like I'm fighting against or fight is the voice, like the vocal cords where the voice and the words of like get away or no, or right. Like there's, there's words that are, that are stuck in the throat. So it's like the hands and the throat. Flight is usually related to um, feet being able to run, right? I'm not always, I'm going very simple right now, but in a lot of times where clients are going through an experience, what they need to know and even if something bad happened and they couldn't do fight, couldn't engage in fight or flight, your therapeutic work to release some of the trauma is not just, oh, it's trauma time. The body, the cells in the memory are holding onto body memory as if it's happening. So what we need to do is to help the client in the here and now, time orientation, be able to orient to the fact that something happened and to help the person in the room and the memory and the somatic flashbacks or whatever flashbacks start processing on some level what they needed to engage in. Or, wow, so as you see that happening, let's just start moving your feet in place. Or let's just notice the words that come up. Or let's notice the tension in your arms, right? Maybe they're squeezing. Maybe they're about to go for a push. There's so many different ways. Now, obviously, there's some clients that go to um, freeze, like they get frozen. Some people go to, like, submit. They're just going to, you know, it's easier to not fight against the perpetrator and not have to fight against something bad happening. Um, and also, it helps, right, the fawn. It almost helps, like, create a layer of numbness. So like, I don't have to feel as much pain if I'm going through it. Cause I realized I can't, I can't engage in fight or flight. Um, and then there's also attach people who kind of align with a perpetrator or, and a perpetrator doesn't have to be an abuser. It could even be um, at work being shamed, a specific instance, right. And kind of like closing up with that person. Cause you don't want to be alone. So I'm not going into all the different things, but for her specifically, we needed to actually help her work through her fight or flight, the interrupted survival strategy that she wished that she needed to do, that she could have done. Um, and so in our work, a lot of what we worked on is like the somatic sequencing and the somatic energy that was trapped in her body um, related to that specific trauma event. Because I had this, have this picture right here. She was flooding. For clients coming in, uh, you'll see this in a future slide. If a client's flooding, I don't want you going and dilly-dallying and, oh, therapy's gonna take a long time. Maybe therapy's gonna take a long time, but your job is to stop the flooding first. Okay, so if it's like if a client is coming in and they're actively engaging in and they have these symptoms, then I want you to come up with a treatment plan on, and she might have flashbacks for a while, but I want you to start getting to the core of what's trapped in her body, help her be able to orient. Obviously, you want to be discerning is the client too dissociative? We have a whole module on dissociation. How do we engage in some grounding? But if a client is already so flooded, sometimes, yes, you want to engage in grounding and you want to start engaging in some processing. So she had, she literally was looking like this terror in her eyes, flooding. And we helped her with time orientation to realize where she was in the here and now. Um, it was so beautiful to work with her because she almost like softened, like she almost got like funnier over time because 
I got to know her in this very hyper vigilant state and only as we worked together and there was more energy capacity, right? Trauma or anxiety or depression or fear, right? It, it takes up all of our mental energy, right? So you're coming in and you can't, you don't have as much capacity to talk, to engage, to dream, to think about getting a promotion, to even take care of yourself maybe. So as we like resolve or process trauma or sensations, right? Then what we're doing is we're digesting, we all know this, right? We're digesting some of this information that's taking up our real estate here, I guess I'm thinking here, and that, and it goes, it processes and then there's more energy, right? So she almost was like funnier and it was like, I slowly started seeing her come back to herself, right? We want our clients, the basis of good healing, right? Is that you want to take what hasn't been digested or is dysfunctionally stored in the brain um, and like help it be digested so they can have energy for real life. Developmental trauma, Gregory. So Gregory um, seemed externally, he's like the client that seems externally okay, but is miserable, right? He came in saying he was feeling very empty and unfulfilled. Um, he was externally functioning, but he had this internal gnawing feeling of unease. Like he just couldn't explain. He's like, I don't belong here. Sometimes you feel like an alien. Um, but he meant it in the sense of just like, uh, he's like, I look at people and I, they seem content and I just, I don't have that. Like I built a life, he had a really hard life. Um, his family moved a few times, but it was more than the moving. It was also his parents never really belonged. They always felt like social misfits. And then he struggled in terms of the developmental milestone of the social um, developmental milestone of isolation to social belonging. And so he accomplished a lot of external pieces, but on the social emotional piece, right? Here's a picture of him as a teenager. He always speaks about like, he knew how to pretend, but he always felt like the other. He didn't really feel like he belonged. And some of it was external, but some of it almost became an internal feeling of lack of belonging. Um, so, right, he had this belief, I don't belong here, I don't fit in. And somatically, how that presented is that he was very disconnected. He felt very disconnected from his kids. And it's interesting, it came from one of his kids as one of his sons was getting a little closer to his age um, of being a teenager. His son was like, yo, dad, like, I don't think you really know me. And first he got a little defensive, but he said he was like, my son's right. I don't really know him and I don't even know how to connect with him in a way that's meaningful. So obviously that was when we started doing some work around like getting for, for Gregory doing work around him and his own teenage self. Because he's not going to be able to develop a relationship with his teenage son, right? If he doesn't have a relationship with his teenage self, the confusion, the struggle, the needs, right? And so even though his son is a completely different entity than who he was, if we're disconnected to our inner world or a developmental milestone that we never accomplished, we're not going to be able to have, even be present with our kids as they're navigating a milestone, right? So that was like very powerful for him. Um, so there was this transgenerational piece of not belonging. And we did a lot of parts work um, with him to be able to really work with that inner work. I have a picture here from Jack Pink that talks about, this is on one of the modules on attachment, like talking about the primary emotions and the three levels of the brain, primary, secondary, and tertiary, and how basically, I actually did this in session with him with clients. Sometimes I'll have exercises where I'll say, let's just draw the brain. Let's get curious about where things are going well or where things are missing or aren't going as well or where you're missing information um, or where there's an unmet or an underdeveloped skill. So the primary right, talks about the basic effective circuits are play, panic, fear, rage, care, lust, and seeking. So those are the primary. Secondary is empathy and trust, right? If you can experience these emotions, then you could develop that. And if they're not met, or if you don't know how to feel or experience them, or there's a lack of safety, or your own parents don't have that capacity, or people around you, you'll feel shame, guilt, or blame. And then we talk about the third, the third level, tertiary, which was connected to Greg here, which is basically if you do have these primary, and then there's the secondary, then you'll have the capacity to name your emotions, an emotional vocabulary, you have the capacity to have distancing skills, feel close to something or someone and also far away in a healthy way. Mentalization is the capacity to almost imagine what somebody else is experiencing, right? And containment. So for him, there was a lack of play, right? Um, and there were some other pieces socially that he didn't get to interact with. Okay, now I'm gonna answer the question that I've asked and people ask all the time, what if a client has all four? Or what if a client has two? Or what if I don't know? right? So if a client has all four, the way that I look at it is I will follow the format of start with boundaries first. I'm not telling you say, okay, let's try this boundary exercise if it doesn't feel aligned, right? I have like um boundary exercise. We have a segment on it, like where we'll do certain boundary exercises if it's virtually or in person. 
um, even the concept of getting to know self and who you are and what you value and what you don't value. But on the generic like aspect, if you're thinking about structuring treatment, you start boundaries, attachment, shock trauma, and then developmental trauma. Um, that's kind of just loosely. But this is what I usually say. If there's a high level of activation and the client needs immediate relief, like I said before about Stephanie, offer a shock trauma or an intervention session first, right? Because what we're always looking for is relief and security. And even if a client comes in and they need to do attachment work, right? Let's say they're very avoidant or they're very disorganized, but they... Um, but really you're noticing that they're stepping all over their boundaries, physical boundaries, emotional time boundaries, then what you need to be able to do is to make sure that you are tending to boundaries instead of jumping prematurely into attachment work, especially for clients who maybe have pre-verbal trauma and the attachment work is going to be a little bit more hairy or complex, right? And we talk about this um, in my training is like, if there is a client that's like almost looking for a mother in you or whatever's going on, you want to be crystal clear that you're working in a very clear framework. Um, but you also do want to provide relief. Once the client's more stable, you can revert back to the format that you're following. So here's just like, right, helping the client have like a clear lens and you want to do one step at a time. You don't want to skip over steps. Um, now, I think one of the things that's really important is from um, a therapy standpoint, is foundation and it is education, right? The foundation for all of us, for ourselves and for our clients is education. I think psychoeducation is power. Um, sometimes like clients will say like, you didn't even help me so much, but I feel hopeful um, in like psychoeducation or as I get to know them. And what I realize is that if they're feeling stuck right here, right, a car is stuck in sand, if they're feeling stuck in their life and all they know, because all they have is a mental model, or all they have is a certain template of knowledge that's not connecting with them. They feel misunderstood. They have self-help books. They're connected with friends or family that don't get trauma or anxiety or um, complicated grief, right? Our whole trauma training goes through shame and attachment and boundaries and grief and dissociation. And so if, if, if there's elements that they don't feel understood, they're going to be stuck. And if they come into a therapy room with you and you're starting to give them education, you give them like oxygen, right? Like they're able, like kind of like a dog here. If you can't get a dog to move, but you give him energy, you give him motivation, you give him passion, they'll likely be engaged in therapy or they'll be more open, right? Um, so one of the things that we talk about in my trauma training is helping your clients understand their trauma reactions and survival strategies and how they show up in their lives. Just make sense of it first. Um, this is one of the modules, right? We teach our clients how to link trauma to their coping mechanisms, identify explicit and implicit triggers, developing your sixth sense as a trauma therapist, um, tools to regulate the nervous system, the limbic system, remove pathology, and know when you're colliding or colluding with clients. Sometimes we're colliding, like we're <laughs> bumping into our clients, or sometimes we're colluding, we're almost like blended with their hopelessness or their fear or whatever. That's what we need to work on. Now, if you're not sure which one your client lands on, right, which what's most important, it's important for you to use assessments. Like we obviously get assessment measures, measures for a reason. And I think like we have a module on assessments. I literally give you like 20 assessments that I've accumulated over my 15 years in the field. Um, assessments are more than hanging out, hang, handing out a questionnaire to your clients. In this module, I teach you nuances you need to assess your client's struggles properly. Sometimes it is a handout. Sometimes it's a question. Sometimes it's a combination. Sometimes it's a creative exercise, right? Um, sometimes maybe you'll use like a, a picture analysis or sometimes it will be, um, it really depends, right? I don't want to, so here it's like you become an expert diagnostician, assess your client's need to improve their functioning. Um, and then I give you instructions how to use like mood, attachment, trauma, somatic, OCD, and more. I do teach people with dissociation, we go over the DES and the MID, um, and then we teach you replicable intervention. So here's just one sample for some people who've asked for a sneak peek from our trauma training. Every module, um, there's sections that I review right? And for the way that the trauma training works for people who've asked is, so we run it twice a year in January and June. Right now we're filling up for January. We have some incredible therapists. We have a lot of the therapists that are not necessarily only trauma trained. Now they might have training in EMDR or somatic, somatic, or they might not, or they might just be like great therapists. Um, we have one that's a sex therapist. We have another one who actually wrote some books on nervous system regulation um, from Sweden. So we have therapists around the world who want more. They want more somatic skills. They want more of that clinical nuance. They want community. So, oh, the way that the format works is it starts in January and we have, it's every other, so every other week we, we meet live for 90 minutes. 
start with the meditation. Um, there is a segment where before we meet, you provide your case consult on a theme or a client case or a question you have. Um, and then there is for every week, there's drip content where you get to watch videos. I'm explaining concepts or showing you an exercise. And then there's information that you read, like this is part of the booklet. Um, and you can download it. You could um, like print it and take notes on it. I love, I, in Yiddish, they say shefing nachas. Like you're so proud. I love when I've seen people in the past cohorts, like print it out and they write their notes. And, and I love it because like they're personalizing these skills to them. Like the trainings I've done and the consultants I've worked with have helped me embody the skills. And so my passion for working with you the therapist is like, I want to help you embody this, personalize it, and make more impact in your clients' lives. So you're giving them deeper relief. So here's just the attachment one: practical impact of attachment, feeling unmet need, feeling unmet needs. Um, and then briefly, right? I think any therapist who's committed to this line of work, um, you're going far places. You want to be known as right someone who's well trained. You want to have better client relationships and feedback. You want a good support network. And if you want to model good a quality life for yourself and for your clients, then I would love for you to sign up to join our, our training, our trauma cohort and consultation program. Um, for those of you who didn't yet get the download, please go ahead. Nicole, we're going to be sending a copy of a recording and also um, a link to apply um, for your mini toolkit. But this is primarily what we're doing. We're accepting applications for January. Um, and I would love to work with you if you're in a place, if you are already an awesome therapist and you just want that growth, you want some of these concepts are advanced, but my goal is to teach you. Um, but it's interesting and my, the feedback from the cohort, like there was one woman who's in the current cohort, her name is Michaela Watson. She's incredible. And she says like Esther, you know, I was afraid that it would be over my head. She came because she wanted to see if she could work in the field of trauma without it becoming too overwhelming. She wanted to make sure she has good, healthy boundaries. And she's like, I love how you can speak to these people. Um, like Ryan runs a whole program in Thailand on drug treatment. And, you know, he's in the cohort and she's um, coming into the field. And, but she's like, you take the time to explain everything. So it's really personalized and digestible to me. And so I'm just saying, if you're newer or if you're in the field for a while, I think the most important thing is that you're in a place where you want more um, and for anyone who applies that we always have a 15 minute consult call so I could meet with you and get a sense of who you are, make sure it's like the best fit. I want you to be thrilled. And I want to feel really good about making sure that the right people are in the cohort. Cause it's just also a group dynamic where you get to know each other. Um, so January cohort, I think six slots are left, maybe a little less at this point. We cap it at 10. Um, and what we are doing, what I'm doing now, especially for those who have been on this live call. Um, is that I'm offering three free 30 minute consultations with me before the cohort begins. So we can map out a plan for your clinical growth. So what usually we have is that um, when you join, there's 12 live calls, 90 minutes, all of them are recorded. Maybe I can actually show you the back end of the training. Um, and, and then you get like a bonus one off, like a 45 minute call with me, right? And so you get to decide when you want to do it. For right now, anyone who signs up, um, then specific to listening to this, or if you've been on this um, webinar, then I'm offering for the first three people, uh, three, 30 minutes. So I'm really, I'll get to know you and connect with you and hear from you and get to support you to map out if it's like clinical or work-wise or anything. So thank you all for being here. Here's the link to apply. Um, let's see if it pulls up. There's a link to apply. Oh yeah, here we go. Um, here's the link to apply. It'll be on a follow-up email where basically we talk about, there's a lot of FAQs, right? Your integrative trauma therapy certification program might be around the corner. First step is you fill out the application then you'll be taken to my calendar to book a free 15 minute call. Then we will meet and go over our, your goals, the syllabus review, and I'll show you the back end of the program. You get all your questions answered. And then if you're a good fit, You'll get a welcome packet and access to all the information for the trauma training certification program. Here is the consultation program, the application form. Um, so it talks about your current role, how many years of experience, your outcomes, and in terms of investment. So you get a certificate of completion. We're approved for CEUs. Um, so the, the cost of the training, if you're paying up front, so the cost of the training is $5,500. If you're paying up front, you get a $300 discount. So that's 5,200. 
If you need a payment plan, we have people, you can pay a six month payment plan. So that's nine sixteen a month. Or if you want an extended payment plan, we have a nine month payment plan of six eleven a month. Um, so it's up to you. Some people join and they start with the payment plan. And then um, over time they say, okay, I want to pay it down quicker or some pay upfront and they just get it taken care of. So that's basically that. If you have any questions, any of you, first of all, I'm happy to hear like, love to hear how this was for those of you who are on here, what you found helpful. Um, or if there's any, I love,